butter. It's everywhere. Go to any grocery store, gas station, or restaurant, and there it is. We think of butter as the same thing. Fattening, good in moderation, it all tastes, you know, fine. Until, that is, you taste butter that's made in small batches. The type that is made by local farmers. The stuff that costs a few dollars more than the generic bricks on the store shelves. Once you taste the good butter, you realize how bland the basic stuff really is. Audio is a lot like this. You listen to music on your phone and computer, you love it. But when you have a chance to listen to some really good headphones or speakers, it's almost like you've never really heard the music before. This is the gateway drug. Once you get a taste, you want to try the stronger options. From a better headphone, you go to a portable amplifier, then to a dedicated DAC, then more and more pricey components to your audio journey. Sometimes, however, more isn't really more. Sometimes more is just too much. I tell you this because of the recent craze over THX this and LDAC that and because of the incessant whining that THD be atomic level small. That's not audio, it's numbers. There's an American company that has a focused goal-driven proposal. Make excellently built products by hand in the United States, make them sound good, make them truly affordable, make them powerful, and give the customer the attention they deserve. Newsflash, I ain't talking about AudioQuest. I'm talking about Bellari Audio. These guys have been around for decades. They have pre-amplifiers and all sorts of audio gear, but they have only two headphone amplifiers. They were kind enough to send over both for review. The first is the HA543 Solid State. The second is the HA540 Tube Hybrid. I've been listening to both and think they sound smooth, powerful, and unique. I reached out to Bellari Audio and spoke to Justin Allen. He's the Chief Operating Officer for the company. I asked if he would be willing to let me interview him. He said, absolutely. I called him up today and we had a long chat. This is the longest interview I've done so far. I suggest you listen to this interview as you would on the radio. I learned from this interview that Justin is a really smart, knowledgeable, and friendly guy. I learned about audio components. I learned about this company. I learned about why Bellario makes their products in their unique way. And I learned that I couldn't be happier to have interviewed Justin. Take a listen to this interview. At the end, I'll chime back in and give you my closing thoughts. Oh, and by the way, remember how I mentioned in my unboxing of the HA543 amplifier that there is a noticeable hiss around 1 o'clock on the volume dial? I emailed Justin about this on Wednesday. He tested two other units he had on hand and explained that was not normal. He explained there is generally a very small amount of hiss when the amplifier volume is maxed out and the enhanced feature is activated. He sent me a replacement HA543 via overnight shipment. I got the second unit today and tested it. He's right. The new HA543 he sent me does have hiss when the volume is maxed out and when the enhanced feature is activated. This is totally different from the first unit I got. Apparently, that first unit has some issues. Now. Let's go to the interview. Hi, Justin. How are you? Good. Good. Great. Uh, do you have time to talk now? Uh, absolutely. Let's go. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk to me. Uh, I'm currently recording. If that's all right with you? Yes, that's fine. Perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for sending the replacement unit. Uh, I got it, and I plugged it in, and it, it does what you say it's supposed to do. There is a bit of hum there, but uh, it's significantly different from the first unit that I have. So, thank okay. you. I, I I don't know why the person would be doing it, but it's a total noticeable difference. And I switched back and forth from the the wall uh, PSU between the two, and that didn't make any difference. So, I guess it's something oh. internal. Must be interesting. Oh well, I got a good one now, and then you got the 540 uh, MK2 also. That yeah, nice. and I and I'm looking forward to uh, listening to that. Thank you so much again. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah. What did you want to talk about? Okay, so uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do at Bellari and how long you have been there? 
Uh, let's see. I'm the, the COO, also a partial engineer, production manager, and I've been here since uh, 1991, so 28 years. Now, when we go to Bellari's website, on the first page it says uh, Bellari has been incorporated since 1989 with a clear objective to reestablishing relevance of MAPE in the USA. Right. And, you know, I... You are obviously aware that audio companies, they may be based in the United States, but they make all their stuff in China or elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, and we've been around since, uh, you know, we, we started. Well, actually, um, I, uh, the person that owns uh, Rolls Corporation, his name is David O. D. Francisco, and he dates, uh, he was the original uh, uh, designer and owner of a company called uh, DOD, which is also known as Digitech. And they, in the 70s, pioneered guitar pedals. And uh, back in the 70s, um, you just made electronics in the USA, uh, especially audio stuff. And uh, I worked at DOD uh, with him previous to starting roles. And uh, uh, at that facility, we had um, uh, multiple manufacturers. and. Um, we were building electronics in the USA. And over uh, from the 90s to the 2000s, we saw some of our competitors um, shift production. Um, you know, they were going for easier and cheaper ways to, to do things. And um, from the 1990s until now, it's just become such commonplace that people just don't build stuff in America anymore. Um, you know, there's a lot of our competitors that say, you know, designed in Germany, made in China, or they'll say, you know, designed in uh, somewhere uh, and, and built in China. And uh, it's just a really uh, easy way for companies to, uh, uh, you know, uh, get away from production. Uh, it makes fiscal sense for them to do so. Um, but in the end, um, you know, you just lose a lot uh, when you can build things right at the same place that you design them and keep tabs on uh, uh, you know, your in-house manufacturing. Uh, you just have such command over making sure the products are the actual way that you want them and not having to make compromises. So, and, and cost is a huge factor, of course, in that stuff. And that's why so many companies have migrated to that kind of business model. But, but we like to build stuff here. You know, we have lots of employees and uh, we want to keep them uh, employed <laughs> without having to lay them off. Uh, and uh, we have no plans of making uh, our items, Bellari, or the Rolls items that are made in USA of anywhere other than our factory here, which we own and it's all paid for and set up. So, yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because uh, doing things in house is should be the end end goal. That should be the beginning goal and should be the end goal for any company, I think, because then, as you said, you have full control and command over the yeah. product that you're designing and your shipping, uh, and. I assume you know something about Drop or Mass Drop. Uh, you've heard of I do, uh, and I own some of their products. Um, I own the uh, M1060s. So I really like them. Uh, I think you're talking about Monoprice. I'm talking about Oh, that's Drop. Monoprice, right. Oh, yeah, yeah Mass Drop. Yeah, I'm familiar with them, too. They sell quite a range of products. Yeah, so with Mass Drop, it like that they collaborate and they, and they outsource their stuff to parties in China to manufacture, and it turns out that it looks like that Monoprice Monolith and Mastrop all seem to be collaborating with the same manufacturer somewhere, and it's just creating things for both companies at the same time, and they look identical to each other and basically sound very close to each other. Yeah. And so that sounds like what what your company wants to avoid doing. You want to have your own yeah. character. Well, and I I have some hilarious stories about these kind of uh, Asian manufacturing. Um, I I don't know if they're some of them are a little lengthy. But um, they're, they're pretty entertaining. But you want to tell us one? <laughs> uh, I, I will. It, it, this is a funny. This is a funny story. I'll, I'll try and keep it really short. Story time is kind of you know not a great interview. But so we we came out with a Rolls product called a PA202. It's a very small um, uh, installation uh, amplifier, 20 watts per channel, and it would go in like schools and, and be mounted in like ceilings and and, and various uh, installation type of places. So we. Uh, uh, we, you know, we start our production here. Uh, we order the chassis from our chassis company, which is um, five miles down the road from us. They've been building our chassis made in the USA for uh, ever since we've been in business. 
And uh, so get those parts on order, and we decide to um, do a graphic rendering of this item and put it on our website. And so we, we do this graphic rendering of the PA-202 and kind of soft announce it on our website, say, you know, this will be available coming soon. And about three days later, um, we got an email from a Chinese manufacturer. And the email basically described that, uh, hi, we have a new product we think you'd be interested in. And they took um, the artwork from the manual that I designed. <laughs> they took the rendering of the product that we had, um, took it and modified it, and then asked us if we wanted to buy it from them. <laughs> and, uh, and, they said, we, and they said, we have these in stock, ready to sell now, uh, 380 pieces in stock. And of course, this was three days after we put it on our website. So we went back and forth, you know, a few questions, and it was clear that they were uh, – the English wasn't their first uh, – uh, they, were, they weren't so good at it. Uh, but we kind of got through a little bit. And uh, uh, anyway, it was – you know, a story like that is just so comedy of how, how these things can come about, you know, how manufacturers can get copied or uh, people can have – uh, you know, contact you and say, you know, would, would you like to buy this? Well, you know, just the egregiousness of some of the things that uh, the business tactics uh, from that region of the world are, are, are just kind of amazing to think about. Yeah, no, I, I agree that the, the Chinese government doesn't really have um, intellectual property laws, and if they do, they certainly don't enforce them. So it's yeah. dangerous to send your your, your hard earned and, and hard designed stuff to China to be manufactured unless you have strict control over what's going on, which is why that's the benefit of having it in the United States, because if you own the factory and you have the whole facility, who's going to rip you off? Well, it's happened. We've been ripped off in the past. We've had uh, some of our competitors, um, big-named uh, companies, uh, just take our products and completely knock them off, uh, kind of all of the, uh, uh, the Behringer uh, Mackie mixer ordeal, uh, the famous one where they Behringer took a Mackie mixer and completely copied it. And uh, on the circuit boards, if you opened up their mixer, it would still say um, uh, Mackie on it and re released it as a Behringer product. Um, and we've had that happen to us on a couple of products, especially our more popular ones. But uh, you know, uh, you're going to get copied occasionally. That that's just that's not nothing new. Um, a little more prevalent maybe as of late, but. Uh, you know, that, that just happens, especially if you have something popular and people want to me to it. You know, that's what we run into a lot is the companies say, oh, so-and-so's building such and such. Oh, I can build that too. You know, yeah. not even put an original spin on it or, or do something different, you know. Uh, so, and that's the annoying part as an, engineer, as an engineer when you say, well, you know, I understand that, you know, circuits, um, audio circuits really can't be patented, but um, at least if you're copying it, you know, throw some creativity in there, you know, add something to it, you know, for the benefit of, uh, you know. But, uh, but we see that a lot with the Asian uh, manufacturers as they, they are really good at copying things, and that's basically what they're all about. One of the things I've noticed with all your products is that it has a very unique aesthetic that it it just has this, and forgive me if, if, if I have this wrong, but it has this, 70s, 80s type of aesthetic that I think is charming in a way. Is, yeah. is that the way you guys wanted to make your products look from the outside? Yes, uh, because if you look at the items that we have for Bolarian rolls, you know you can kind of you can tell right away that they're they're all made in the same factory. You know they all have the same fit finish kind of look to them. They're of course different sizes, and we have rack mount items for rolls, and the Bolari pieces are. Uh, kind of rounded, uh, and that chassis design was uh, just something that we came up with. Um, and recently, a lot of the new Bolari products, uh, you know, they're only about a year old, so it's kind of newer for us. But, um, but yes, um, you know, when you look at certain products, especially, you know, you can kind of see like some of the manufacturers use like what I would call car stereo chassis. You know, they're kind of like that extruded aluminum, and, mm -hmm. and aluminum is a great material to use, but they have kind of they look very similar you know and they look like they're all from they, you know, all the metal came from the same factory and um and when we design something usually the design for us uh because making chassis in america uh is a lot there's a lot of cost to it so using um aluminum front panels that we do on our uh rack mount stuff is quite expensive but we still utilize that material 
Um, but yeah, um, a lot of the stuff that we, we come out with, we, we try and keep it um, similar in genre. So, say, so looking at the product line, you're like, yeah, you know, I can I relate that this all came from the same factory. You know, some things are different colors, but you know, it all looks inclusive and it looks different. The fit and finish is much different than uh, than some other items, and e even things like down to the screws. Uh, you know how they go together, and uh, and that you know most people can tell. You know, it, it, and it's maybe not something that's obvious, but after you pick it up, you're like, yeah, yeah, this is different. Yes. Yeah, so speaking of of different and turning to the HA five four three. Uh huh. You know, I I I don't know what I was thinking when I first saw the photos of this thing, and I in my mind I had something pictured that was larger than it is. This thing is palm sized, but it feels robust. And I can't find any technical fault with it. I mean, the fit and finish looks fantastic. It looks like it that the thing. It looks like something that audiophiles constantly gripe about that they want uh, in a enough, Chinese yeah. manufactured thing, right? I I want my amplifier or my DAC to feel heavy, and I want it to 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 have robustness and metal. And yours has it, but it has it for less than a hundred dollars. Yeah. How is it possible for you guys to? to squeeze as much power as you have into the 543, keep it as small as it is, and yet still use all this top quality metal that I see and feel. Yeah. Um, that just comes with the, the years of partnering with the, uh, the metals company that, that, that bends our chassis for us. Um, it comes with uh, us having a guarantee that we're uh, going to do so much business with them and basically keep them afloat and uh, keep business going. So it's kind of... Um, uh, you know, if you were to take, um, you know, one of our units and say, you know, how much would this cost if I made in Asia? Of course, it, it depends on the quantity. Uh, you know, how many are you going to buy? Uh, you know, uh, 200 pieces production run would cost X, and 200,000 pieces production run would cost much, much less per unit. Um, so, um, so really, well, one of the things that Bolari has uh, to manufacture uh, that quality that, that's in those items, you know, there's no surface mount stuff. Um, the, the components are put in by hand. Um, it's through whole technology. So, uh, and I saw you saw images of the you took the the, the 543 open, which we encourage. Um, uh, is um, you know the, all of those kind of things lend to the, the physical weight of it, and it's built with 1970s technology, really. I mean. Uh, the trace sizes that we run, uh, the resistors, the quarter watt resistors that we use, um, you know, all of those things are, you know, this is uh, pre-1980s technology. And, uh, uh, you know, all those things are really great for audio, um, I think, uh, especially using larger capacitors, you know, 100-volt uh, capacitors instead of surface mount, little tiny caps that uh, may change with uh, various voltages, um, you know, so... Um, you know, all those things add up, but, but really the value of Bolari, um, and, and you know, it's kind of weird when you look at audiophile stuff, is you've got um, companies making things for a, a just outrageous prices, but you say, you know, how, how can you build something that costs $5,000, and if you start looking at it closer, those people are um, per possibly doing it part-time, they're possibly uh, have working out of their home, which would you would think would save money, but they're ordering, um, you know, the chassis in one or two. Uh, and some sometimes they actually build these one off. Some of these big audio shows you go to and you say, you know, how many of these have you sold? They usually don't tell you. But after you get, you know, after you have a few drinks with them, they'll say, I, I, I sold two of those last year. And so then you take that number, you kind of work backwards and you say, well, what does it cost to buy one chassis? You know, what does it cost to buy one uh, you know, one of these and five of these jacks, and you're ordering these, you know, pieces one at a time and paying, you know, a, a enormous amounts for shipping. You know, if you if you just build one amplifier and you bought parts from various places, um, that amplifier shipping is going to be almost as much as some of the components, you know. Um, and then you've got to build one off and then test it and go through. So, um, and, and just completely on the other side, you've got um, high production manufacturing, which is you know, building uh, 10,000 PC boards a day, uh, ordering 10,000 chassis, and instead of having them, uh, the chassis bent, they'll usually have them uh, stamped, uh, have uh, dies made, and those dies are very expensive, but once you're doing higher quantities, it becomes very worthwhile. Um, so there's, you know, 
somewhere in between there is uh, uh, something affordable and worthwhile having. But um, uh, getting back to the, the reason uh, there's a value in Bellari is um, Bellari in itself, uh, I would consider a, a very small segment of audio. You know, we don't we don't have uh, you know not selling millions and millions of Bellari products, but because Bellari uh, is uh, manufactured by Rolls Corporation and Rolls Corporation is professional audio, uh, you know, very high grade uh, commercial. Uh, you know, installation type pieces where our customers say, you know, I, I really need this to be serviceable in the field. I really need this so that, you know, if it goes down at a job site, uh, you know, that somebody plugged into the wrong place, you know, I can crack open the lid, one of my techs can work on it because I can't overnight it back and forth. So it's kind of got that reliability issue to it. Um, and that's what, that's one of the things that adds a lot of value to Bellari is Bellari is a, a small company, but it's um, being manufactured in the same facility as the rolls items, and we're buying, you know, hundreds of thousands of jacks to manufacture the rolls items. We have a partnership with our metal company that we're, uh, you know, rolls uh, manufacturers uh, uh, about 45,000 items per year, and Bellari is uh, considerably smaller than that, but it gets to the benefit of, uh, of being manufactured in the same facility in the same way, and our parts cost uh, because we're buying so many parts. Uh, Quality-oriented parts, of course, like the chassis. You say, you know, feels good, um, but we're able to to uh, to get uh, higher quality, lower cost items, and and to, and pass that on uh, to to the consumer. So with the five four three, I'm sitting here and I'm and I and I've been listening to this since when did I, when did I get it? I think a couple, yesterday, a couple of days ago, and. And I and I can't help but think that there's a character to the five four three that seems to be missing in THX amplifiers or ultra uber clean amplifiers that have no distortion and no noise all to, at all. And when you say that you're using technology that's been around for decades in your amplifier and your in your stuff, why do you think that that stuff of old, the technology of old, still has merit and worth now in 2020? Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, I wouldn't say, I mean, you know, if you're using a computer, you want surface mount everything, of course. Um, if you're using telecommunication stuff, um, the technology that you'd use to do that. But, you know, I've, I've worked on uh, a lot of uh, really old guitar tube amplifiers. And uh, you crack open a, a 1968 Marshall Plexi, and you look inside, and you're like, oh, there's a handful of components, and then there's these big transformers, and uh, uh, and of course vacuum tubes, and uh, and you look at it, you say, well, well, wait a minute, there's there's only like 35 parts inside of a Marshall uh, 1968 Plexi uh, amplifier, and of course they're world renowned, you know, almost all uh, guitar players. That's the holy grail of an amplifier, and you say, well, how can this sound so good with just 20 parts in it? And sometimes the simplicity is the answer to that. Um, you know, if you're using, uh, I, I've seen some, you know, headphone amps, and uh, I've seen, uh, seen the inside, and they've got relays, and uh, you know, literally like uh, just 400 components inside. And you're like, well, it's a headphone amp. What do you, what, you know? I mean, there's lots of things that could be going on, but you know, I don't know if that's it. If um, if a lot of the um, common things that you buy today, you know, oh, this is a, a nice, uh, you know, headphone amp, and, uh, and and if that has any correlation to it. And uh, to be honest, um, there's really no reason I could put on to say why one thing sounds better than the other. You know, it's always just, uh, you know, it, it goes back to the, the classic argument for audiophiles is do you buy things on specifications or do you buy things on sound? And then you have people say, well, you know, I didn't want to buy your XYZ unit because it has, you know, 0.05 THD. And, and the reality is, is you can't even hear 1% total harmonic distortion. And to be honest, most tube amplifiers, or uh, at least, well, guitar tube amplifiers might be a bad example because they have a ton of harmonic distortion. That's why they, uh, they have the distortion. But, um, uh, you know, there's what people like uh, is, is, is just that. Uh, you know, your ear is so inaccurate. 
uh, your ear can't hear certain things. You know, uh, you've got frequency response as you get older. Um, you've got uh, left and right hearing and differences. You know, there's all these factors, all these things that are adding up to as a person ages that their hearing decreases. But, but, but having said that, that doesn't mean that they can't enjoy music. And, and when you say, well, um, you know, I remember doing this. Uh, I worked at uh, Fosgate Audio uh, a long time ago, and um, you know, we did a whole bunch of uh, kind of obscure tests. You know, whether you'd like to hear your speaker grills on or off, or uh, whether people preferred this. And, and we would have uh, at the time it was partnered up with. Uh, they were manufacturing Fosgate Audio Onics was manufacturing at the DoD manufacturing facility, which the owner of this company previously owned. And we had you know hundreds of employees there, and we'd you know get a sample of them and, and just find out what they liked. You know, so design things, you know, that say, okay, this has really low THD, this has, you know, uh, almost no uh, IMD, this has, uh, you know, a, a, a amplifiers, you know, these have a great dampening factor and all these other things. And then you sit down with people and say, you know, which one do you prefer, A or B? And, you know, you do these pseudo tests. It's really hard with human ear, hearing to uh, to listen to something and then even three or four minutes later listen to something else and get a, a good opinion. You've got to s switch them very quickly and, and it usually takes a few days. You know, uh, When we test things here, it actually takes us possibly a week of listening to it, going back and forth and saying, you know, do you prefer uh, this unit with um, sounding A or sounding B? And, and it can take months before we get something, but um, the reality is, is you know, we just really don't know why people like what they like. And everyone's different. Um, some people have a preference of liking a sound that has uh, characteristics of more treble, or uh, some people are really like the bass. And, and so you say, you know, when people review something and say, you know, what's the best? What's the best headphone amp I can buy? And, and, and you could just get to a point where you're like, you know, you, you just have to, to listen to them and see what you like. And, you know, it's hard to do that these days because there's not a lot of stores around where you can go and demo things. So you have to rely on a lot of uh, uh, Internet uh, reviews, uh, which are very useful, some of them. Uh, and you have to rely on, you know, on specifications. You know, I, uh, I'm not saying that you shouldn't just throw those out the window. Uh, you know, they're, they, they kind of tell you a little story. Um, but, but, you know, when you're comparing, you know, somebody's headphone amp, uh, and there's many wonderful headphone amps out there, and uh, I'm pleased to see that so many that the headphones are, are becoming more and more popular lately. Um, you know, uh, specifications are just that. Um, you know, they're useful uh, to tell you a, a ballpark of what you need to know, but like you say, it's just amazing how, you know, you could have something that's so small and so simple, and it, it seems to be pleasing, uh, and then you can have something else that's completely on the opposite, uh, that, that's expensive and has multiple parts in it, and you may or may not like it better. Of course, you might prefer the opposite. You know, you might say, "Well, I really, really like the sound of this one." But it's amazing to me how, um, uh, how just how uh, different everyone is. Uh, and sometimes when you have a really great uh, component, you know, people will migrate to it, saying, "Yeah, yeah, we all think this is great, and we really like it, and, and it probably has merit to that." Um, but it's really, uh, you know, doing as much blind testing uh, as we've tried to do over the years, and I've been at this quite some time, it's just amazing, you know, what, uh, you know, even if you have, we have uh, professional sound testers here, and I've worked with uh, training sound testers and doing hearing testing on people and qualifying them to be sound testers for, you know, 30-something years. And I will take things home. Uh, we were designing a phonograph preamplifier, which we spent almost eight months on going back and forth trying to get it just right. And I would have uh, my wife's friends uh, over, and I would say, hey, can I A, B something for you? You know, I'll, uh, I'll give you an A signal and a B signal, and, and, and just I'll flip them back and forth, and you just let me know what you like. And it's amazing how people who are not even into audio are, are great at picking out little differences. Uh, and... Uh, uh, you, you, know, you just wouldn't think that. You'd just think, oh, well, you know, somebody who's a, a professional sound tester or somebody who's been in the business for a long time, is, they're the ones to ask. Uh, and then, you know, you take some of these components to just the regular public, and, uh, and, and you learn a lot, you know, about people's preferences and, and what, they, what they like and don't like. But getting back to your main question, you know, as far as um, what would be the best or why something sounds 
better than another thing? Um, you know, I think if, if the industry could actually honestly answer that, we'd probably have a whole bunch of components and, and items that were near identical. Uh, and, you know, you, that's not what you see. You see such a wide variety of manufacturing types and philosophies and design. And uh, some things are simple, some things are complex. And, and, and that'll just be, uh, that'll continue on. You know, there's no one way to say, you know, what makes something the best. Would you say that the components of the 543 are on the simpler side of construction than the uh, complex side? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, um, well, with components, you know, you have resistors, capacitors, operational amplifiers, transistors. Uh, you know, in, in, in any unit, you've got a power supply. So, uh, you know, some, some companies, uh, you open it up and the power supply is, you know, wildly uh, uh, parts-driven. And they're doing that to, to get as much noise uh, as possible out of the circuit. Um, but but if you look at just you know the components they're used, uh, you know uh, for the most part, if it's not tube based, it's uh, it's got an IC inside, and and different ICs sound different, uh, even though their specs are very very similar. You can hear subtle differences in each one, um, and uh, uh, you know you've got uh, this is uh, this is kind of funny because. Um, being in commercial audio for such a long time, commercial audio is about reliability and sustainability. And you know, can this be repaired? You know, is this got little surface mount parts in it that, you know, uh, basically if it, if it goes down, do I have to throw it away and buy a new one? Or if it goes down, can I actually fix it? And being in commercial audio for so many years, um, and, and uh, the Bolari consumer audio being relatively new, only about a year and a half old. The conversation that we're having now reminds me so much of when we would design uh, guitar pedals in the uh, in the 80s, and um, people would say, you know, well, I prefer the, this guitar pedal because it has a better sound than this other one. And back then, uh, you know, pretty much everything was uh, quarter watt resistors and 100 volt capacitors and um, you know bigger components, and and, and we'd have um, the people, uh, uh, you know, within the manufacturing within the building getting an argument saying, no, I think those capacitors we got last time were more expensive and they sounded better. <laughs> there would be, no, these are identical capacitors. We bought them from the same place, you know. And the reality is, is it was perhaps just more of uh, what people thought that they heard rather than what they did hear. And, of course, when you start plugging these things, you know, guitar pedals back then, we'd plug them into oscilloscopes and do all these testing and, you know, trying to find out if there was any merit to you know, does this capacitor sound better than this capacitor? You know, uh, even though the manufacturer said it was the same one uh, and manufactured in the same place, maybe it was a different revision, you know, or something. And then we did all these tests to find out, you know, what types of capacitors we thought uh, were better or, you know, was spending $5 on one cap worth it or should we just continue to buy the ones that we've purchased? And, um, uh, and so, you know, it's just so subjective. Uh, it's just so hard to, to put your finger on exactly what's happening. But I would say the 543, being that it's, uh, you know, you saw the inside, the capacitors are quite large uh, compared to like surface mount. Um, and, and that's probably one issue that I would say. Uh, you know, surface mount capacitors, um, they will change their capacitance with uh, heat and, uh, 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 and voltage. So if you're running uh, surface mount capacitors at 20 volts, um, that capacitor can change uh, over over time as you use it, as the unit heats up, um, and that just doesn't happen with larger capacitors. You know, 100 volt capacitor that's a you know a through hole capacitor, old old 1980s technology. Which I say 1980s technology, but if you were to crack open um, you know one of the amplifiers or preamplifiers that costs twenty thousand dollars, you would see. Um, you, you wouldn't see surface mount. You may see surface mount if it's got a digital switching, you know, for the remote or something like that. So there, there, there might be some digital, uh, some surface mount parts in the digital section if they, if they've got uh, something going on with remote. But predominantly, in the uh, audio path, you would see very large capacitors. You know, you'd see very large, at least quarter watt or half watt resistors. Um, and so whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's just something that the industry, you know, you notice when looking at different, uh, different items. Uh, and uh, predominantly those very, very expensive items would be through-hole technology. They wouldn't be uh, manufactured in, in a surface mount kind of way. 
and that's just because the components that they're using are very expensive, uh, and uh, those components are always radial axial parts that are going into a circuit board rather than a, a pick and place machine putting surface mount parts on. So I, I would say, you know, overall that would that would probably be. Uh, you know, set the the 543 apart from from some manufacturers, but there's a lot of manufacturers out there that are building really quality stuff too. So, um, but that's just something that we do. Speaking of, of quality stuff, what, how do you choose the components that go into, say, the 543? Uh, well, that actually just comes off of years and years of experience. Um, you know, capacitors. You've got electrolytic capacitors, uh, and, and electrolytic capacitors and a power supply. Um, those um, uh, those don't necessarily, you know, they're not audio capacitors. Um, so if you're using, uh, you know, so you open up a unit and you say, oh, well, I see electrolytic capacitors and, and I can see what name brand these are. Um, electrolytic capacitors are usually very standardized, very similar. Um, I would say, in my opinion, uh, not a lot of sound difference. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to swap those out and be like, oh, yeah, that was noticeable. It's just not going to be there. Film capacitors, um, those those are different. Um, you know, and anyone who has a guitar and you pop in some Bumblebee capacitors in your Les Paul and you take them out and you put a different brand of capacitor in there and you're like, yeah, I, I can hear a difference. Um, it's fairly subjective. Uh, it's not over the top, you know, noticeable. But uh, uh, but it's you know it's a thing uh, uh, so um, I, you know I I would say um, the way that you buy parts is you have to partner with a company that you've dealt with for a long time so you know their quality and consistency um, and I have we you know uh, being at the, being at this a long time we have bought components from um, big name companies and got them in and had issues with them in. Um, tolerances or uh, build quality and reliability also uh, so really what you have to do is you know if you're manufacturing something say you know why did you buy the capacitors that you bought that were in there and say oh well, you know I've been buy I, I purchased a few million of these capacitors every year and uh, and I know the company I know who they are you know and we have them uh, actually the capacitors that we make you know, the electrolytics we actually have them color coded for us so when we're building them it's easy for us to quality control the boards um, and uh, you know as far as other components go um, we do a, a, a large amount of testing on ICs uh, uh, here you know to find out noise and, and various things and uh, we've we usually uh, have been sticking with companies uh, for at least five or ten years, um, you know, we're used to them. We know who they are. Uh, we know that we're not getting uh, counterfeit parts, which is a, a huge thing in the last three years of manufacturing. Uh, even a lot of bigger companies have been duped into to buying parts from various suppliers. If you keep uh, moving around your supply chain, um, you know, you just never really know who you're getting them from, um, and they could be duped. And then, of course, if they purchase counterfeit parts, you would be duped also. So really, um, uh, really, I think that uh, the, to answer your question, it just really comes down to experience and being in the business that long and, and knowing you know, who, who you've trusted in the past. Not that that's 100% foolproof because things could happen, um, but, uh, uh, but, I, but that's usually my, would be my best advice. If someone said, hey, I'm starting to manufacture something, you know, should I just buy parts by this name or should I what should I get and you say well you know the, the best thing is your experience you know knowing that you've been buying and testing and using millions of those particular components and what their failure rate is and uh, what their tolerances are and you know uh, do the capacitors dry out over five or ten years uh, which is another thing uh, you know but it, it just comes down to knowing your your suppliers you know and, and uh, being dealt Dealing with them for such a length, of, a long amount of time, that you're confident in, you know, what they've done in the past and what you you presume they're going to do for you in the future. I, I want to hone in on um, some of your your products, the two that the, that uh, you sent me, the five four three and the five forty, because I think that audiophiles need to experiment and have their minds open to other things beyond just what's the hype of the week, and your products. Uh, seem to provide something that's both unique and something that is 
uh, available elsewhere too at the same time. For example, the 540 isn't the first uh, uh, tube amplifier. But well, yeah, there's there are lots of great ones out there. Yeah, but it's it's priced, I think, really well, and it seems to be competing with some things that are made in China yet have questionable quality. And when we turn to something like the 543, there's something that your website says, and I'd like you to explain it to us what you what your your company means by it. And here's what it says: the Delari AJ543 sets a new standard for what is possible in a headphone amp, and I want to know what that is. Tell us what it is that you mean by that. Oh, okay. Good question. So when we, so very poignantly with a 543 and all of the other components, uh, Bolari that we make, we, we look at something and someone says, you know, come out with a headphone amp. And we say, well, what would you like on it? And they say, oh, copy so-and-so. Well, that, that, no. No, we're not going to do that. We're not copying anybody. You know, we're engineers here. In fact, you touched on this, I think, on your unboxing review uh, about how you haven't heard of us. Uh, you know, uh, Bolari is uh, very few, uh, uh, you know, uh, not a lot of press, so to say. And, and that's because we're all a bunch of engineers here and we suck at marketing. But... Um, uh, and we don't spend hardly any on marketing either. I guess that would be another reason why we uh, we can uh, sell our items for what we sell is we don't have you know full colored four thousand dollar a month uh, ads in uh, in the various popular magazines if magazines are still alive these days I'm not sure but um, but when, so so when we des- decide to, to build a product it has to be different and the funny thing about different is you know we build a, a, an equalizer. And people say, oh, I'm an audiophile. Equalizers are horrible. But then you start to talk to actual customers and actual people um, and what they're actually using their systems for, and you get a completely different description of what it is that they want. And so the 543, when we came out with it, we said we want to do a headphone amp, and we want to do it you know, differently. And so we put the enhance button on there. And, of course, the enhance button, you know, people say, well, what is that? You say, oh, it's a phase shifting, um, re-equalization of the original signal, similar, very similar to a, a sonic exciter, a sonic maximizer, or a psychoacoustic processor would do of old. There's many, many names for the same thing. And, you know, an audiophile would say, oh, well, that's, I'm a purist. You know, I would never use an EQ. And you, and you say, well, you wouldn't, but we're selling a th- thousands of them, so somebody must like them. And I think that's kind of what I've noticed a, a lot of the uh, the audiophile, you know, oh, well, you're supposed to do it this way. Uh, and, and so the 543, you know, having, uh, when we designed it, we said, well, it's really small, but what would be cool? We'll put XLRs on the input, too. Uh, you know, and, and, and a small package that size, you know, you, say, you know, you look at competitor stuff, not not everyone. There are some really great bargains out there. Bolari is not the only one, and there's a lot of great companies making a lot, a lot of great equipment. But um, predominantly, you know, you say, oh, well, something that has, you know, ballast XLRs in it is, you know, $500. Well, why? You know, uh, well, put them on there, uh, you know, and uh, – uh, and, and, you know, uh, a mute button is a simple thing to put on there. And, and you know, uh, uh, a silicon dampered potentiometer, you know, it costs money, but it's on there. And uh, in that small of a case. So so really when we, we do something, we say, you know, a, a lot of times we've had a lot of the other Bolari stuff is red. And people say, oh, my goodness, it's red. You know, can't you do it silver? No, silver's boring. <laughs> you know, and, uh, not, not that really silver is boring, you know, um, but – uh, but we try and do something different, you know, something that if it's already out there and you can already buy it, why would we me to it? You know, why would we just copy, you know, some how, uh, you know, something that's already in market, you know, um, you know, we would put a spin on it, you know, uh, and uh, over the years, um, Rolls has probably sold uh, probably half of a million headphone amplifiers in various uh, various things, mostly for studios and mostly for professional sound reinforcement uh, and uh, and those kind of things. So when we we decided to do the the 543, um, you know, we knew that we wanted to do a small headphone amp, but you know, we just looked, you know, how can we do this different? So that's what we. So yeah, the, on the website we put, you know, that that's different. You know, this hasn't been done before. You know, how many headphone amps have a button that that, that 
that does what that does, you know, and, and it's not very well explained on there, but basically the button is uh, one of our sonic exciters um, put inside uh, of the 543. So, and, and there were size requirements. You opened the lid and you saw that there was virtually no room to put yet another part in there. It was pretty right. compact. Uh, now, of course, if we did a surface mount, you could probably put, uh, you know, three times as many components in there. But, you know, we wanted to do it with quarter watt resistors, through hole, 100 volt capacitors. You know, we wanted to make sure that it had uh, a build quality, like I said, you know, of the, the late 70s uh, technology. Um, but that that's um, something that we kind of took from, uh, you know, uh, Rolls has built uh, almost 2 million units uh, in its uh, existence. And we, you know, we really focus on, uh, you know, if something breaks, you know, 50 years from now, can you fix it? You know, which is kind of a weird thing to say, you know, if you have, uh, you know, some of the uh, very inexpensive stuff that breaks and it was, you know, oh, what do you do now? Ah, buy a new one. It, you know, is it worth shipping back? Nah, nah, throw it away and buy a new one, you know, you can buy one on Amazon. But all of our stuff, uh, we, we really try and design it and say, you know, would the customer after this breaks, after 25 years, send it into us to have it fixed? Well, they should, you know, uh, and that's what we're set up to do. And, that, and that's one of the other things about Bellari is, you know, people say, well, uh, you know, uh, what happens if I get something, I, you know, and it breaks, or what happens if I get something and, you know, I plug it in the wrong outlet? Oh, send it back. We'll fix it. And uh, we fixed items. We've been um, uh, building a phonograph preamplifier called the VP130 for about, it's about 12 years now, not really that long, but, you know, we have people... Uh, who, you know, uh, broken, uh, you know, it's broken in some fashion. They'll say, they'll call us up and they're kind of surprised, you know. Yeah, I've had one of these for 10 years. What should I do with it? Oh, send it and we'll fix it. Oh, is it going to cost a lot? No, actually, we're going to charge you hardly next to nothing to fix it up. Most of it is just the shipping back and forth. And, and that's one of the things that you don't get from the made in China companies. You know, if you get something that's made in China, you, say, you call them up 20 years on and say, um, yeah, I, I really like this. You know, I used it. Uh, uh, it's broke. What do I do now? Oh, well, you know, you can buy one of our new models or something like that. Whereas our the stuff that we design coming from um, a professional audio background, where things need to be reliable, and if they're not, they need to be serviceable. You know, the uh, end of life for these is you know your lifetime. Uh, so, and the technologies that they that they're built with, you know, you can still service 1968 Marshall Plexis. You know, you just get in the components, they're readily available, um, you know, and uh, some of the obscure surface mount ICs that people are using, um, you know, those those change with time, um, and uh, that might not be available exactly the way it was before, so it, it's just something that we do, but, uh, but getting back to your main question, the 543, you know, we really just tried to do something different, uh, knowing that we'd get ridicule from some uh, some reviewers saying, you know, oh, well, it's not a purist thing. Although it's surprising because in the headphone amplifier section, um, you know, some of the audiophile reviewers, you know, that we've had in the past for various units have been, you know, really like, well, EQs suck. You know, I, I can't believe you put tone knobs on this. That was, you know, really an audiophile like. But um, I think the reality is that in the headphone market, there's a lot of people that are really open to. Um, you know, and headphones themselves aren't necessarily flat. Maybe that's where that could kind of come from is they're already used to coloration of some sort. They're already used to, um, you know, these headphones have bass, these headphones have treble. And if you have a way to adjust that or enhance that or get a pair of headphones that you thought were dark, you know, I got these headphones, I really like them, but they're kind of dark. Uh, oh, well, you can press in this button and, 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 and they'll be completely different headphones. You're like, wow, you know, that's pretty amazing even for me you know being uh, in this industry for that long uh, something like that is available um, and, and like I say we're not the only ones there's many many manufacturers that do a great job of uh, building uh, affordable uh, you know items for people uh, you know and I, I think that uh, when we read audiophile reviews we always get this impression that everybody's spending twenty five thousand dollars for <laughs> you know uh, for for various items and, and you know we read these magazines and they're just littered with you know things that cost more than cars and, and that's just your perception it's like oh well wow that I must not be doing very well I, I can't afford these things and the reality is you know just based off our numbers our initial sales velocity of Bulhari, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, you could sell two or three of your $20,000 amplifier and, you know, we're just 
barely started out and were selling thousands of a, a $99 this or a $149 that. And, um, and, and so, uh, you know, that's, you know, how do you make money? Well, you sell one item for a million dollars or you sell a whole bunch of items for, you know, you just, you know, it's always called the make it up in volume, but we really believe that it's, you know, making it up in giving customers what they can afford and what they really want. So I, I want to touch on two things. Uh, I, I, I want to talk about the repairability of your components. But first, uh, I do want to highlight that that enhance button on the 543 really does something, and it does something different with each type of headphone. Like in, in the unboxing I did, I tested with three, and all three had a very different response with the one enhance button. And the only other company that I know I've heard consistently does a very good job with enhanced buttons of sorts is iFi. Their their filters are just very tastefully done in my opinion. And your enhanced button on the 543 seems to follow that trend where you have an immediate response, but it's not so overblown that it destroys the sound signature. So whatever yeah. tuning that you guys have done with it is, I think it works out really well for the most part. Uh, yeah, me me and the sound test guy here, we spent a few days trying to make it, you know, trying to make it not over the top in coloration, but not so subdued that you just kind of press the button like, nah. So we uh, we went back and forth on that, uh, trying to get that just right. And uh, it's fairly ironic, the engineer that designed that, uh, David O. D. Francisco, um, he designed the 543, and he gave it to us. And we started, you know, swapping out parts here and there, trying to get this a little bit better, this, you know, like, you know, have the volume knob sweep right. And then, of course, everything that we build here, um, we, um, uh, we make sure it has tons of gain, which is sometimes a fault. But, but if you're going to mess up, you might as well have more gain than you need. Uh, sure. The 543 has got tons of gain to press headphones. Um, and, uh, uh, and ironically, we went back to his original design. We swapped out a whole bunch of resistors, tried a whole bunch of uh, different calibrations to, to make it a certain way, and uh, we ended up going back to the original design because it was just an, enough correlate, uh, uh, coloration that you're like, wow, that, that's, you, know, you would notice how dramatic it was, um, uh, but it wasn't quite over the top. So, uh, but, yeah, I remember uh, spending about two days working on that. Well, it was time well spent as far as I'm concerned. The second thing I wanted to touch on was what you had just said a few moments ago, which was, you know, having components in, say, your headphone amplifier that in 25 years somebody could come back and say, can you fix this? And your answer is yes. I think audiophiles need to understand that the newer components in newer devices that cost $800, $900 doesn't necessarily mean it's a good product in the long run. So if somebody buys a 543 or a 540 tomorrow and in a year and a half something happens, what can they expect your company to do if they say, hey, I'm having an issue? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, if it worked for that long, then clearly it's probably uh, uh, some kind of overload or breakdown or usually a burned-up resistor or uh, possibly a blown IC. That'd probably be the most likely thing if you hook something up and used it for a year and a half, and then all of a sudden one day it did, stopped working. You know, maybe you plugged in a, a set of headphones that didn't have it all the way in, and you shorted out one side or something like that. But um, the nice thing about through-hole technology is if you have somebody who, a friend, you know, who's a little bit into electronics. You know, you could open it up, unsolder the resistor that's blown, put a new resistor in, and they're usually fairly easy to see. You know, they usually a blown up quarter watt resistor is, you know, melted a, a bit, so you know exactly what's wrong. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's uh, ICs inside if you had a bad IC, uh, which is very rare, but it does happen, especially if you build that many units, you're going to get one or two. Um, but those are easy to fix. Um, and going back to uh, anyway, to uh, to shorten it up a little bit, um, you know, you just call us. You know, we're here. We're the manufacturer. We're here in Salt Lake City, Utah. And if you're in, you know, uh, California, and you say, oh, I really need this fix, I'll say, well, we're close to you. You know, send it to us, and we'll fix it. it takes us about a day or two. Uh, we'll send it back to you. And uh, you know, other than the shipping to us uh, to get it here, you know, we'll pay for shipping back. So, um, so that that's kind of you know one of the things that 
you know, made the Made in USA, and we're not the only company. There are other Made in USA manufacturers out there, but I always look towards that, you know, to, to, to just say, you know, well, you know, I, I understand that if I, I get a box from, from China or something like that, it's probably, you know, uh, fairly inexpensive in some cases. Uh, but, uh, you, know, you know, what happens if uh, two years on, you know, uh, something happens? And some of the co- sometimes, you know, you have to even look at the company, uh, how long you've been in business, you know, are you a startup? Uh, are you guys going to be around? But e- even at that, you know, there are lots of companies that, you know, honest companies that have uh, that have went out of business that we've seen, you know, that we're like we respect and say. Uh, but if they built it in such a way that it was easy to repair, then you know anyone uh, who's even moderately in electronics or or even a full on electronic technician, which is you know you can get those anywhere that repair stuff, uh, they'd be able to fix your stuff, you know. Uh, so that you know that's always something I kind of think about. So. Uh- Tube amplifiers, headphone amplifiers, I think are, are becoming more and more popular for various reasons. Would you tell us what prompted your company to design the 540? Because there was a 540, and then there's a 540 Mark II. Right. Uh, the, uh, so in I, essence, those if you have a 540 original, it's the same circuit as the 540 Mark II. There are no sonic circuitry differences. The only thing that we did with the 540 Mark II is we had a bunch of interview uh, reviewers say early on, "Oh, well, I like the volume knob on the front. Uh, I prefer, uh, you know, the jack in this position." Uh, and so we accommodated that on the MK2. But the circuit is identical. And I had uh, we've had people call, you know, as soon as you release an MK2, uh, people call and say, "Hey, I've got an MK1. What's the deal?" And uh, anyway. Uh, it's the exact same. There's no sonic difference between the two. Um, but the reason that we got the headphone app, we actually, uh, I think we were talking to Roy Hall at Music Hall, and he said, uh, yeah, headphone, this was, uh, boy, I think we've been building the 540 now for about 10 years. And uh, he said, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we had a, a tube headphone amp. Headphone amps are kind of, you know, getting popular. And that was 10 years ago. And uh, so we came out with a 540 and uh, re-released it. And we didn't do any marketing. We actually, um, you know, just sold it through uh, a couple of channels and, and really, you know, didn't do any press or anything. We had some good reviews for it. Um, and then uh, just recently in the last few years, headphones so it seemed to be more popular to me. We're getting a lot more customer calls about questions about headphones. And so um, we uh, we decided to, to redesign, you know, the the – uh, with the knob placement and, and, and just the aesthetics of the 540, keeping it fairly similar uh, in size and everything. We, we didn't see a reason to make it smaller, but um, but we just uh, uh, you know decided uh, the the Blari uh, Blari historically uh, has been uh, we manufactured um, uh, under the Blari name since 1989. Early on, was um, high end recording studio vacuum tube gear. So if you do a search for Blari old units, you'll see um, dual microphone preamplifiers that are vacuum tube uh, with hand-wound um, U-metal transformers. And you'll see uh, we had a, a sonic exciter, uh, which was wildly popular. We, we, we had a, won awards for it and various things. That was a, a vacuum tube sonic exciter with single rack space, and these were silver and gold front panel uh, aluminum-type uh, rack mount units. And, um, and, and uh, the home studio market really – changed um, because now a lot of things are uh, software based and and, and it makes sense uh, for for doing home recordings why you would you know uh, you know units that are seven hundred dollars a piece and you need multiple of them if, if you're doing home recording now you can do a lot of software based things and get really great results um, so we still have a few components that are studio oriented but um, but we did, under the Blari name, build uh, a VP-130, which was a phonograph preamplifier early on. And that had a ton to do with Roy Hall at Music Hall. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had built a, a phonograph preamplifier under the Rolls name called VP-29. And um, uh, sold, uh, we sold just thousands of those things. And, and that was just a customer who called and said, you know, I've got a, a receiver at home. This was in uh, the early 90s. I have a receiver I just bought. And it doesn't have a phonograph in. How do I hook my record player to it? So um, David uh, O.D. Francisco, the, he said, well, I'll make you one. And so we started with that. And then as that grew, um, the Bolari line, the sales of uh, vacuum tube 
high-end recording uh, for home or even recording studios have diminished in the numbers. Um, that's fallen off. Uh, we've just seen a decrease in sales over uh, over the last you know 15 years. Really, uh, we had a, the height was uh, 15 to, to 20 years ago. We were selling a lot of it, and uh, and so we we kind of took the Bellari name. And we had the 130, which was a component, a, an item that we built for 12 years. And we had a 540, we built it for 10 years, but we really weren't behind it. We just kind of built it and said, yeah, it's cool. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But we saw the market for, um, you know, made in USA uh, headphone uh, stuff for semi audiophile or audio uh, uh, affordable components that were unique and cool. So we, uh, in the last year and a half. Uh, released all of the Blari products on, you know, you can go to blariaudio.com, and I think we, we also put them on the rolls.com uh, page, but Blari Audio is the easier one to, to, to see just the Blari products. Um, and, uh, uh, and try to do something different. Uh, but, uh, but the 540, this, this is kind of interesting. We, we had it for, for years, and uh, we were selling it exclusively through a couple sources. And uh, our numbers got down to like, we were only selling like, and a month, which is you know, numbers for us, uh, is really low. And uh, but we built it, you know, we we just didn't really get behind it. So we really re-released the version of the MK2, and uh, I did a little press behind it, you know, uh, got a little behind it. And, uh, and and we're not selling ten a month now. <laughs> they're they're doing very well, uh, even compared to some of the the popular Rolls products. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure exactly what Bolari hit on in the market. Uh, I'm not sure exactly if we just got lucky or, 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 or what happened, but uh, uh, so the but the newer Bellari products uh, were surprised to see the velocity of sales in, in this short period of time too. So, well, I, I, I can say your question. It, it does, and, and I can say that it's really hard to find American-made tube headphone amplifiers, hybrid amplifiers, so you know, uh, the complete tube amplifiers. It's really hard to find them from America within America. You got to go yeah. to China to get to get stuff and that's an iffy proposition for a lot of people. Yeah. Now I'm looking at the I'm looking at, at the tube that's in that comes with the five forty and it's a twelve AX seven, which I think is an American tube, is that right? No, that's a Chinese tube. Uh we okay. put a uh we bought those from uh Ruby tube. Uh we bought out all of their last tubes. I think we bought uh fifteen thousand of their tubes. So um we bought tube futures uh, a few years ago, uh, and at one time when we, at the height of Blari, when we were doing our studio uh, gear, we were we were using about 5,000 tubes a month, and uh, like I say, that had, that market's completely changed, um, and the price of tubes goes up and down quite a bit. And the 12AX7 tube, which is the most popular preamp tube, it's used in guitar amplifiers. And the cool thing about 12AX7 tube is it's readily available. You know, you can buy 12AX7 tubes. Uh, inexpensive ones for you know twelve dollars, and you can buy new old stock um, telephone and tubes for three hundred dollars, and and they're worth every penny in my opinion. But um, uh, the uh, uh, you know the cool thing about tubes is uh, if you don't like the sound of your amp and you get sick of it, you know just buy a different tube, stick it in there. Uh, the twelve AX sevens are all biased uh, within the circuit, so you don't have to to change the bias or anything like that with a power tube. You just simply pop a different tube in, and, and you're good to go. Um, but uh, the uh, the tubes that we use are uh, a Ruby tube, and Ruby tubes are uh, the generic Chinese tubes. They did a lot of testing to match them up and make sure the quality was good. But uh, but we do use a Chinese tube, the stock tube that comes with it. The Chinese tube has good base characteristics, um, but um, uh, again, just like we talked about with capacitors, everybody seems to have their opinion of what they like. Uh, and it seems like the highest opinion, of course, is the more expensive tubes. But um, to be honest, I have um, uh, I have quite the collection of tubes. Uh, don't tell my wife how much I ever spent on tubes, but I've got a lot of money in tubes at home. And uh, uh, I I actually like in certain circuits uh, I like uh, I like the tube that comes with it. It's got very smooth, very good bass response. Um, I do like the GE new old stock. 5751s. A 5751 is a direct replacement for a 12 ax 7 Assuming the unit you're putting it in has enough current uh, to run the filament, which ours, of course, does. 
Uh, and so I, I would say I like the Chinese 12x7 that comes with it, or I like the GE New Old Stock 5751 from uh, circa 1958 to 1967. Those are my two favorite tubes. I also like the RCA New Old Stocks. Those are very consistent, so anything previous to 1970 is pretty cool. But again, uh, in some instances, you're paying as much for a tube as you would the actual unit itself. But, uh, but we've, we've got thousands of tubes here. We've done tests on many, many tubes, and, uh, and they all test a little different. Uh, you can see uh, one of the things about tubes that's interesting is you can actually see on the oscilloscope a slight difference in the, in the frequency response. You can actually notice a dramatic difference in, uh, in noise uh, of, of various tubes. And the new old stock tubes seem to do really well uh, in the noise genre of things just in general. So what can people expect in the future from Bellari as far as headphone amplifiers are concerned? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, we usually don't t talk about what we're coming out with uh, because we have a, a rule that uh, we don't talk about a unit until it's available. Um, but we are working on a couple of things. Uh, the biggest thing that we've been hit up for is to do a power amplifier, a Blari power amplifier. And that's nothing new for us. We have MOSFET power amplifiers which are audio quality for the rolls section. So uh, we could easily just take that technology and move it over. We have some wonderful circuits for that already. But you know, we said, nah, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it different. So we've, uh, we've talked about a few things. Um, but for the most part, um, we have a couple Bellari products in, in the pipeline now. Uh, we, uh, we don't release them until they're done, so it could be a year. We, we don't know when they're going to be ready, but we are working on some. We have, about, we have about eight different projects <laughs> that we're working on right now. But like I say, we don't release something until we consider it a fresh new spin or idea on something. Um, you know, we always got heckled when we first had our phonograph preamplifiers because we had volume knobs on them. And like, well, who puts a volume knob on one of those? Well, we did, and now it's becoming more popular. You know, we're we're seeing more and more people put them on there, and uh, we have a, a phono uh, preamp for Bellari that has uh, bass and treble controls on it. And uh, people, who would want a bass or treble control on a phonograph preamplifier? That's ridiculous. Uh, well, apparently a lot because we've sold a lot of them, and we get calls, you know, from people saying, oh, I've been looking for one of these, you know, and uh, sometimes I'll just, you know, talk to them and say, well, you know, what about uh, tone controls? You know, aren't those kind of out of fashion? Aren't those kind of like, you know, not audio file? People are like, uh, no, it's what I wanted. <laughs> so I, I, I'd like to give manufacturers an opportunity to tell us who their product is for. I think it's important for them, to first of all, to know what their market is, and second, for people who are in the market to know if they are the target. When looking at the 543 and the 540, wait, who do you think should be interested in purchasing these two products? Um, dudes like me. People who really like <laughs> audio. I, lo I love audio. But you know, man, I, I like to spend my money on other things. I don't really have, you know, if I had $20,000 in my pocket, I would buy $20,000 worth of stuff, but it wouldn't be $20,000 worth of audio gear because I like audio, uh, and I have a headphone amp at my place, and I have, uh, you know, a, a record player, and I have, uh, uh, you know, good speakers and all this other stuff, but, but I don't want to have $100,000 tied up in my home system. I, I think that would be kind of, for me, um, that's that's just not me. So so what I what I found and I found this a lot through Facebook, uh, people posting things, and I'd contact them and ask them questions. There's a lot of people out there who really like audio, but they're like, you know, I want something really nice, but my threshold is like 200 bucks. Does that make any, you know? I, I, and so and then of course you read all these audio magazine reviews of you know. I, this is funny because I, I had an audio magazine and uh, it was sent to me. And it said, affordable home preamplifier. And I was like, oh, this sounds great. I'm going to open it up. And I, I go to the page, and, and, and it was $1,695. That was affordable. And so I went in the back with the magazine, and before I showed people the article, I, I walk up to them, and I said, hey, uh, what do you think an affordable home preamplifier should cost? <laughs> and people were like, I don't know, like 149 And I, and I show them the magazine ad, and they're like, that's ridiculous. Sixteen ninety five is affordable. You know, sixteen hundred ninety five dollars. Now, of course, if you went to Rocky Mountain Audio Fest and you had a sixteen hundred ninety five dollar 
preamplifier, you know, that'd be a bargain. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like cars. You know, you get, you know, people like Ferraris, you know, and uh, not many of them own them. And we all talk about them, and they're all cool, and we all memorize some of the specifications for them and say, you know, oh, this is a Ferrari 548, and it has this much horsepower. And the reality is not many people own them. And so when we come out with the Bellari product, it's designed for everyday people who are who are into it, you know, uh, even like a, a set of M1060 headphones, you know, is that for everybody? Well, no, you know, they're like 299 unless you're smart, you get for 199 But those are the people that, you know, are looking for a bargain. They're looking for something that sounds really, really good, that's, that's exceptional, but it's affordable. And, and when we come out with a Bellari product, that's what we say. You know, we want something that's, that's exceptional, that sounds really good. Um, and, but we're really looking for um, affordability. We're looking for, you know, can you just buy this on a whim and be happy with it? You know, will this, will this be years of enjoyment, you know? And, and sometimes when you're you – know, to be honest, I don't own uh, – okay, I own a phonograph that's, that's pretty expensive. It was a uh, full board list with like $2,800, but of course I know people in the industry, so I got it for less, but I still spend 900 bucks on it. And, um, and that's a lot of money. I, I, I'm not really happy with it. I would rather have a 200 or $300 phonograph it's just it's just me you know it's a lot it's a lot of money to have tied up into it so that's the person we're after and it's funny because you know i read all of these things online and i see all these reviews and um you know of course i um uh when the blurry line was first launched i contacted i know all of these people in the audience industry i i contacted i won't drop any names but high-end people of reviewers of magazines and, uh, and I said, oh, here's the new Blari line. Let me know if you want any of these components. I'll send them to you so you can evaluate them. I heard nothing. And then like a week later, I sent it back again, and all I heard was – and this was their reply. If you would like to, um, uh, if, if you would like to advertise with us, uh, it's $1,800 per month, and we prefer to do a 12-month contract, and uh, we'll uh, put your ads on our online on our little symbols that pop up on the right hand side, and we'll we'll put you in the magazine, and and then of course it's reading between the lines. If you advertise with us, we'll review your stuff in the back mm. you know, and tell yeah. you about it. And so so we have no reviews, uh, and and that's fine with us. Um, you know, we actually um, I'm kind of glad you know that some high end magazine hasn't touched or wanted to review our stuff and and i get it you know they need to make money uh that's how they operate you know they don't work for free but i do find it a little bit disconnected from their audience that they don't say oh well we're reviewing this product this week and here's my raising review of a ten thousand dollar power cord which will of course uh you know fill in all of the descriptions that they have uh this will work great in your system you know i don't even know what you plug a ten thousand dollar power cord into but it must be an expensive piece but um, but yeah, the the people we're selling Bolari to when we we design something and think about it um, are just you know average people who love audio, and um, uh, and it's really easy to sell something that's you know 150 or 99 on a lot of them and have a lot of people happy about it, and it's what we're good at. Uh, you know we don't uh, uh, we don't have any plans of uh, making a, a ten thousand uh, dollar preamplifier or a uh, you know, two hundred thousand dollar power amplifier. Um, it's just not what we're about. You know, I, I I could do it. You know, if somebody came to me and said, "Well, you've been engineer for a long time. You know, the, the owner of this company has engineered probably five hundred products in his lifetime, audio products. Um, would you guys be interested in doing this project for us?" I said, "Well, you send us some money. We'll 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 take a look at it." But but it's not what we do. You know, we we do this. Is there anything that uh, you think? My, my audience sh should know about your company or your products. Um, anything that we haven't discussed so far? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I actually think that I I, uh, I went off and, and told you enough. I I think we covered most everything. <laughs> I think you know we're just an American manufacturer. We're blatantly honest about what we do. Um, there's no smoke or mirrors or or anything. You know, uh, we do have, uh, like I say, the owner of this company, David O. D. Francisco. Uh, he's designed 500, at least 500 products in his lifetime for guitars and audio and studio and professional recording, and um, and that goes a long way. And I, I have a, a you know a funny story uh, that I could share. So 
um, we've been making sonic exciters. Well, for he's been making David's been making sonic exciters for for forty something years. Uh, he's probably designed twenty five different versions of it throughout the companies that he's owned. And uh, I won't drop any names, but somebody was in here. Uh, they stopped by, and they're a big deal in the audio business. And uh, uh, and, and they they build. Uh, record players, and, uh, and we were talking. I said, you know, have you heard about a Sonic Exciter in, in the record player industry? He says, no, I'm, I don't even know what that is. And I, I told him the history, which is a long history. You know, you've got Sonic Exciters, the Fleetwood Rat and Rumors album was uh, the, the most famous one for the one of the first to use a Sonic Exciter in the recording process, and then throughout the 80s and 90s, there were Sonic Exciters in every studio, and then uh, you know, there's many many companies building similar items. They're all slightly different. And I, I told him, I said, um, I said, well, what do you think? And he says, well, let me hear one. So I, I hooked one up with headphones and he's like, what is this? I said, dude, you're older than I am. You've been in audio your whole life. You haven't heard one of these in an audio show? He says, no, never heard this. I don't know what Sonic Exciter is. I said, well, do you think we should build one? He said, hell yes, you should build one. That's a stupid question. I said, okay, all right, we'll build one. He leaves here uh, he, I met with him the whole morning. He leaves here about 1 o'clock. About 3.30 that day, so about two and a half hours later, uh, I had went into uh, David's office, the owner of uh, Rolls and Blari, and I said, so-and-so said that building a Sonic Exciter is a really great idea. And he says, uh, yeah, I think it is. I like it. I'm going to build one. About an hour later, he calls me in. And he says, uh, it's done. I said, what's done? He says, yeah, I, built, I, I designed the full Sonic Exciter. I got the chassis. He says, I might need you to help me a little bit with the chassis, but I think I got it knocked out. But he says, the schematic's done. Uh, the board's laid out. Um, it's all done. And so I, uh, so I emailed the, the, the person. I won't release his name. I won't drop names. But, uh, I, but I have a big fan. I'll say that. And I say, uh, yeah, the, the SE560, the Bolari Sonic Exciters, through design, uh, we are sending off uh, to get a prototype chassis made. Uh, we'll have a working prototype in about three weeks. It's going to take us a little longer on this one. And uh, full production in about uh, eight weeks. He says, what? Huh? You, you, who, who designs a unit in an hour and a half? I said, well, you know, if you've been at this for uh, for almost 50 years, um, it, it's not that big of a deal. you know." And, and we had, uh, you know, designed countless Sonic Exciter previous to this. We had designed, uh, you know, Many many units, so uh, so it went pretty quick that particular one, and uh, and luckily that one uh, we didn't have to do a lot of uh, alterations after we designed it. It went through our sound test and it went through uh, our product procedures and all of these things to make sure it was right for the customer. A couple little uh, adjustments with gain and adjustments here and there to make it more customer friendly, but but pretty much it was all done. So I, anyway, I think that was an interesting story. That's one of the stories that I'll always remember. Well, Justin, thank you so much for sharing so much about your company and uh, telling us all this stuff. Uh, I think it's really important for audiophiles to be exposed to uh, companies like yours, American-made, well, well, you. handmade uh, stuff. And thanks, you know, thanks for contacting me and uh, uh, do your honest review. And uh, and uh, thanks for your interest. Oh, absolutely. Anytime, I'm, I'm happy to do these sorts of reviews. I think this is really special for everyone uh, because. I've had some feedback already from uh, from some of my subscribers who are showing a lot of interest in your products, and they're just waiting to hear more about them. And it's uh, it's unfortunate that uh, more people aren't talking about your products, whether they like them or dislike them, is totally up to them. But yeah, having absolutely. your product out there is absolutely essential to counter all the hype stuff that really is kind of wishy-washy, not particularly good in anything. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of it out there right now. But having said that, there are some great manufacturers. But boy, there is a lot of snake oil out there right now. And uh, and when I see, uh, you know, uh, power cords being reviewed in a magazine for twelve thousand dollars, my thought is, what do you plug that into? Uh, who who could you? I actually had a customer here. Um, who was asking me about that? He says, well, you know, uh, I, I read this article, and I'm, I really think that I should get this $2,200 uh, power cord. And he says, what do you think about it? And I said, well, let me, let me, you know, be as honest as I can. Um, what are you plugging it into? 
he says, well, I have this you know, unit, and I won't go into it, but it was a, a $450 unit. And, and I said, well, you know, um, my opinion is, is please don't do it. Uh, I don't think you'll be happy, and, uh, uh, and I don't think it's a worthwhile purchase if, if you're really looking to upgrade your system. But I would give a general rule of thumb that if the power cord costs more than the unit, I'm going to just say, overall, that's a horrible idea. Do not do that. And uh, and uh, I don't think he, did, he ever actually he did call me back and let me know what his system was like. But but uh, but yeah, that, you know, you read a lot of these. Um, you know, uh, you know, there are fuses out there that are um, hundreds of dollars for a fuse. And I always say, well, well, what happens if you just bypass the fuse? You know, so like if if you replace a fuse in a unit and the unit sounds better, well, what would happen if you just took the fuse out and uh, and put a piece of wire in there? You know, would that yeah, the awesome too? It's the Occam's razor solution, which is what is the simplest answer to this problem? Yeah, really. You know, and, I'll, and I've had that before where I've told that to people. I said, well, what if it blows up? Say, yeah, bring it to me. I'll fix it for you. I know a guy. You know, oh, well, that's risky. Yeah, I don't know. Buying a $175 fuse sounds pretty risky to me, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, it's all out there. And But, you know, um, Boy, I, I wish I had more time. I got more stories for you. I was uh, one of the CES shows 25 years ago, and there was the first power cord that was $5,000, and there were engineers just pulling their hair out and yelling and stuff. And at that time, I said, I said, you know what? I'm not going to spend a lot of energy trying to dismiss the science or argue or anything. I'm going to spend my energy coming out with new products that people want to buy, and I don't care that somebody sells a power cord that costs 12 or 20 grand or. Um, you know, or, or somebody sells a fuse that's you know more expensive than the unit they're putting it in. Uh, if you buy it and you're happy with it, cool. The only thing I require is that you don't come to me and say, "Yeah, my system sounds better than yours because I got an expensive power cord." Uh, then I'm going to have an opinion. But other than that, you know. Uh, but the one thing I do see is a lot of people call up here and they, they you know, they're not, you know, 30-year experts, you know. Yeah, I, I, and I'm not an expert at marketing. Bellari's marketing sucks, but we are experts in engineering. Uh, we've been out a long time. And when people call in and say, you know, I've got this and this in my system, and I've got this and this, what do you, you know, and I'm, I'm thinking about upgrading to, to this X component or this X or that. And, you know, listening to these people, you know, they've called the manufacturer of the company already, and they've got this, you know, starry-eyed, delusion of how great it's going to sound if they swap out a power cord or a fuse or, you know, there's tons and tons of examples of this in audio. You know, there's the uh, the that you put on things, the electromagnetic brick that impedes frequencies, uh, the, um, uh, the little sensors you put around your room to absorb certain frequencies, you know, all these, you know, very, very questionable physics and, and science. And, and the only thing I feel bad is when um, people get duped, you know, people are buy into it or, or get caught off guard. Because someone like me, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get caught off guard. Um, mostly because I'm really cheap and I'm not spending 12 grand on a power cord. But um, but some people do, and, and that that's sad. That that and that's a, a black eye for the entire audio industry, you know, that we're all a part of. And, and for that, um, you know, if somebody says, look, I'm a, a multi-billionaire, I you know, I drive. Uh, Ferraris all day, and so what? You know, I'm going to buy a power cord that costs 20 grand. Hey, cool. I don't care. You know, um, but uh, the, the only time I, I really see it is when people call in here. You know, people are in the market to buy something in our price range, and they, they, you know, they've spent a thousand dollars here and fifteen hundred dollars there, and and that's the that's the side, the dark side of the audio industry that I, I really don't like, and, and a lot of that's perpetuated by um, what magazines say, you know, and what they. Uh, you know, people who who uh, uh, are in in that genre of things, you know, uh, elect to tell people about improvements that they'll make, and uh, and that's the one part that I that I don't like about audio. Other than that, everything else is pretty cool. All right. Well, Justin, thank you so much. I'm going to be in touch very soon because I'm sure that uh, some of my subscribers are going to have extra follow-up questions. Uh, okay, sounds good, man. Yeah, give me a call here anytime. Great, I, I won't you. waste as much time, but I figured uh, if you want the whole story, I, I just lay the whole thing out there for you. Hopefully, it wasn't too boring. No, I think I think this has been for me. It's been very pleasurable because I you've told me so much more about how things work and how you guys work 
that yeah. the more you talk, the more we get to know you, and the more we get to know you, the more we can trust. And I well, think that's really in, in the marketing genre of things, I could go on and on about the cost of certain things. You know, there are certain places that won't carry Blari. Uh, because the markup's not high enough. A lot of the high-end music stores expect double their money. If they buy a component for two grand, they're going to sell it for four. And, uh, and you're like, well, wait a minute, that's a really high markup, which is a markup that's non-existent in professional audio or, or studio equipment. You know. And but yeah, we've had a lot of uh, places. That I won't name names. I don't want to be mean to anybody. But uh, but yeah, they're like, no, I, I'm I'm not selling your stuff because I, I you know. I have to double my money or triple my, and there's there are some components that you that you buy that are uh, that are uh, five thousand dollars. The company sold it for fifteen hundred. The manufacturing cost was only two hundred. So you're like, how do you get from two hundred dollars to manufacture to selling it for that kind of money? You know, and there's just all of these middlemen in the way. You know, and they get their press and they get their, you know, everybody's making their huge commission and and, and whatnot. Now, having said that, there's not a lot of those that are sold. Uh, but I, I think a lot of, I think with the internet, I think a lot of these things we all talk about and we all uh, we all kind of read the reviews and see what's up. But but they're not selling many of them. So, but uh, but anyway, uh, not to keep going on. But uh, yeah, call me anytime. Uh, I, I've been in this for for quite some time and uh, I know quite a few people and. Uh, we definitely, uh, you know, on the engineering side, that's where that's where we're strong at at Bolari. So uh, we'll keep building stuff and uh, making them affordable and uh, and hopefully making the people happy. Good. I expect uh, people who buy your stuff will be happy. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for talking, man. Great. No, thank you so much. All right. Bye. 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 Take care. That was a long and informative interview. I think I love it when companies are willing to share openly. No, they can't tell us their proprietary secrets or what they have in store in the upcoming years, I understand. But they can and should explain what their company is about, why they do what they do, and who their target audience is. Clearly, Justin is a very modest person. Everyone I've interviewed so far, Zach Mirbach, Hobie Seacrest, James Alvarado, are open, conversational, and seem quite honest. This is my impression of Justin as well. It felt like I was talking to a co-worker over some beers. You tell me, but I didn't get the impression that he had rehearsed anything. We learned that Bellari is a true American brand. It's not the type that claims to be American only to outsource all their components and manufacturing to China. Audio <coughs> quest. No, this is a brand that makes all its stuff in-house, in Utah, by hand, and by engineers who love what they do. We learn that there is indeed a free creative process at Bellari. An engineer can walk in and say, I want to make X. They'll think it over, play with components, figure out what works, argue over sound, and then if it's good enough, they'll make it. It's not a corporate overlord who sits down and penny pinches every little thing. It's not a matter of what the current fad is. No, in a way, Bellari does things like ZMF, Monolith, and Heart Audio. Just like them, Bellari makes stuff for us, not for the uber-pretentious, self-congratulatory crowd that buys $12,000 cables. So, if you've been looking for an American brand that makes powerful amplifiers, here's Bellari. Their HA543 has such unique and worthwhile features that I think it's a shame it's not mentioned more often on the internet. And I've been listening to the Tube Hybrid HA540 and man, it's smooth. I love the build quality of both amplifiers. I love the simplicity. I personally like the sound. And I love that Bellari has a policy to take care of its customers today, tomorrow, and 25 years down the line. If that's not unique in a company, I don't know what is. I hope you've enjoyed this interview with Justin Allen from Bellari Audio. I know I certainly did. And if you're in the market to buy more audio gear, give Bellari a closer examination. Now, maybe it's not your cup of tea, but you'd be missing out if you didn't try. <laughs>